Hello, good afternoon to everyone that is coming in. Um, we are going to sh start very shortly. Uh, we're just waiting for a few more participants to come in. So we are going to get started in just a minute or two. All right, now we're thrilled to be presenting the timely panel entitled Beyond Redlining, Black Lives Matter and Community Development. This is sponsored by the ABA section of the Civil Rights and Social, Social Justice. This panel is, a three part, is part three of a series of rapid response webinars on this topic. We are actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues. So please visit AmericanBar.org forward slash CRSJ for updates on these programs. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A, not the chat function. If you do not see the controls, please ensure your screen is not idle. We will address questions at the end of the panel. We will be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who has registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. And with that, we're thrilled to bring you today's program entitled Beyond Redlining, Black Lives Matter and Community Development, Part Three. Redlining is a process by which banks and other institutions refuse to offer mortgages or worse rates to customers in certain neighborhoods based on their racial and ethnic composition. Redlining is one of the clearest examples of institutionalized racism in American history. Although the practice was banned in 1968 with the passage of the Fair Housing Act, it continues in various forms to this day. Today, our panelists are Sajid Khan, Sabina O'Hara, Jeremy Orr, and Etienne Toussaint. Reggie Simmons and I are your co-moderators. -moderate I'm Michael Bell. I'm a member of Berry University's Black Law Student Association. Today, our first speaker is Jeremy Orr, who is a staff attorney for NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. He focuses on drinking water and source water protection issues, working to ensure that everyone has access to safe, sufficient, and affordable drinking water. With a background in grassroots community organization and public interest law, or most recently served as the National State Program Director for the People's Climate Movement and as an environmental justice coordinator for the Transitional Environmental Law Clinic, or holds a bachelor's, master's, and law degree from Michigan State University. He is based in NRDC's Chicago office. Thank you for the introduction, Michael, and thank you to the ABA Civil Rights uh, and Social Justice section for you know having uh, me speak today and just for hosting this this webinar series throughout the summer on uh, you know such an important topic. Uh, so again, I work for the Natural Resources Defense Council as a staff attorney on our Safe Water Initiative, which you know our, our main goal is to secure uh, clean, safe, affordable drinking water uh, for all residents throughout the country, and that includes you know addressing you know policy. Uh, and legal issues of water really from uh, source to tap. So as Michael mentioned, my background is uh, really in community organizing. I got my start, uh, you know, right out of college during institution-based, kind of church-based and neighborhood-based community organizing, uh, particularly around environmental justice issues, which then, you know, led me to, to want to pursue law as, a, as an avenue to continue to, to advocate for, uh, you know, Black communities and, and, and other marginalized communities. Uh, you know, I, I you know, went to law school, came out, and in a practice civil rights and uh, environmental law with a you know, real focus on environmental justice over the years. Uh, my current work at uh, NRDC includes a number of different issues around drinking water, but in particular focusing on issues of getting lead out of drinking water and, and other water quality issues like PFAS, uh, you know, work on issues from affordability, uh, you know, really making sure that you know, people have access to water regardless of income uh, or ability to pay. Uh, and of course, right now in, in the midst of a pandemic, we've been working around the clock to ensure that, uh, you know, communities have access to water during this, you know, COVID response as, you know, the number one uh, 
thing you can do to protect yourself is, uh, you know, wash your hands, uh, but that's difficult to do when uh, you don't have water. So that's something we've been working at the, the state and federal level around. And as we've seen, you know, Black communities have been disproportionately impacted by the virus, right? I mean, we're contracting it at much higher rates and, and, and we're dying at much higher rates too. Uh, so that's, you know, just, that's, you know, tied directly to uh, access to water as well, right? And it's through this work uh, of, of drinking water that, that it's become more evident to me that the kind of lasting impacts of, of redlining and, and racist community development uh, has, you know, impacted or, or led to environmental injustices that Black communities uh, have historically faced and uh, really still face today. I think, you know, I just want to give a couple of, of, of examples of that. Uh, one in particular, uh, as we all know, uh, with the Flint water crisis, right? Uh, I think is a, a prime case study of, of what happens when the community development, uh, you know, excludes uh, Black people uh, and other people of color, right? And, and, and leads to uh, the, the kind of degradation that uh, we saw and still continue to see there and around the country. I mean, we all know, you know, what happened to the Flint water crisis, right? It's, it's not a issue that needs to be rehashed, right? But I think what, what many folks uh, don't realize is the lesser known issue of the historic and systemic issues that led to the, the Flint water crisis, right? So about a couple years after uh, the crisis began in, in 2015, uh, the Michigan Civil Rights Commission uh, released a report in February, 2017. The report was titled, uh, the Flint Water Crisis, uh, Racism Through the Lens of Flint. Uh, and this, uh, follow, this report followed a, a year long investigative process which held about three public hearings, which got testimony from uh, 150 residents, uh, experts, and, and government officials, right? And, and the result of that report uh, was that, uh, you know, policymakers, government leaders, and decision makers failed the people of Flint, right? Surprise, right? That's something that you know, we all knew. Uh, but even more than that, it dug down into some, some deeper systemic findings, right? And it found that, uh, you know, three major findings were, uh, you know, the implicit bias uh, that led to it, you know, came from many decision makers. Uh, the other was that there were environmental justice concerns as well as emergency uh, management concerns, which you know raise a whole other uh, you know issue of constitutional and and, and, and democratic you know, policy issues. And then lastly, one of the the most significant uh, issues were the the structures, institutions, and systems that created Flint, most notably uh, segregated housing, that right, played a significant role, which led to you know ultimately led to the Flint water crisis. Uh, and the you know one in particular uh, company, General Motors, right, played a huge role in in community development uh, in the early 1900s, right. So so typically you have a situation in which um, you know a corporation may foster community development, right. But uh, so you know General Motors, which was founded in Flint, uh, you know produced about a million cars between its founding in 1919. So between 1908 and 1919, about 11 years, it produced over a million cars. Um, of which, you know, in these factories, Blacks were actually at this time, weren't allowed to work on the assembly line, right? They were only allowed to work as janitors uh, or in the foundry, right, doing, doing metal work. So either really dirty jobs or really dangerous jobs. Uh, and in an effort to attract, uh, essentially attract more uh, white workers to the, the factories, uh, GM created its own um, uh, community development corporation called, called uh, Modern Housing Corporation. So from 1919 to 1919, 33, uh, you know, GM had a corporation that actually built housing, uh, created, you know, new neighborhoods, expanded, you know, neighborhoods in Flint, um, and, you know, sold these homes to only, you know, right residents, right? And, and, and at this time, they had, you know, expressly, uh, you know, racially restrictive covenants that stated, uh, you know, that homes could only be leased or occupied by persons, uh, you know, well, couldn't be leased or occupied to, to any person or persons, you know, not wholly white or of the Caucasian race, right? leading to, uh, you know, Black residents, you know, having to live in the outskirts, having to live in neglected neighborhoods, uh, you know, neglected not only by the company, but by the city as well. And long after, you know, this, this, this you know, GM's company, you know, their, their development corporation ended uh, in 1933, right, this kind of, you know, behavior and in, in, in de facto housing segregation continued to carry on, as you would expect, right, as we, you know, see in many instances today, right, but, but this, um, you know, these practices, you know, after they were illegal, um, you know, continued and it set the stage for uh, really the, this, this Flint water crisis, right, that we saw it, and we saw how it directly impacted, you know, black communities who are left to live in these uh, neglected parts of, of towns, you know, of the city of, of Flint. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, I, I work on a number of water issues uh, in my current job at NRDC. Uh, I work with uh, a team of amazing attorneys who uh, you know, who litigated around the water crisis and were able to secure a $100 million settlement to replace all the lead pipes and 
one of the things that still stands out to me is, is when working with the engineers, uh, you know, some of the factors that they determine where lead pipes are at in the ground, if they don't have an inventory that says, you know, we know the pipes were laid here in this year, uh, one of the key factors that they can determine whether lead pipes are in the ground in this neighborhood uh, is the historic and present uh, demographics of that neighborhood, of that community, right? So we're literally simply saying, we can guess based on who lives here, uh, whether or not you have poor aging infrastructure that poisoned you. Uh, and as we've seen right over the last five years since this crisis started, uh, is that these pipes are in the predominantly black communities, right? So that, that says a lot to be able to say, we know that housing was segregated from this time to this time, de facto would continue. Uh, so therefore, based on that, we know where, you know, maybe poor black people are living, you're most likely to have, you know, the pipes that are poisoning you. And that is the case, right? And Flint is just one example of this, right? This continues to happen uh, all over the country. It's, it's historic and it's, is present, right? And then fast forward from you know the Flint water crisis uh, to you know September 2019, when NRDC senior uh, staff scientist uh, Christy Pullen Fednick you know partnered with Environmental Justice Health Alliance in coming clean to release a report titled "Water Down Justice." Uh, now this report you know looked at uh, Safe Drinking Water Act enforcement and violations in uh, all communities across the country. Uh, and just to take a step back, in short, the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, is supposed to ensure that all Americans have access to clean, uh, safe drinking water, right, at, at the most basic level, like nothing should get in the way of that. However, this report, uh, you know, revealed what many of us already know, right, is that, you know, the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, did, was not protecting, you know, the water of, of all residents, in particular, uh, you know, Black residents. So the report explored uh, the relationship between uh, socioeconomic characteristics and drinking water violations. And it looked at five factors. I looked at race, uh, income, uh, native language, housing density, uh, and lack of transportation options. Those were the five factors that you know were compared when when exploring where the most violations were. Uh, and the report found uh, you know that drinking water violations increased in uh, communities of color, uh, in low income communities, uh, you know areas where there were more non-English speakers. Uh, areas with people living under uh, crowded housing conditions, uh, as well as, you know, areas where people lack uh, access to, uh, you know, adequate transportation options. Uh, and this analysis of those factors revealed that, you know, race, ethnicity, and language were uh, the, the three strongest connectors uh, between uh, inadequate enforcement of, of the Safe Drinking Water Act, right? So that meant that, you know, the most marginalized communities were more likely, significantly more likely to have violations, uh, Drinking Water Act violations uh, within uh, their community. Right? And of all these factors studied, of course, right, as, as many of you could imagine, like race had the strongest relationship between uh, inadequate enforcement of the Safe Drinking Water Act, especially in, you know, Black communities. Uh, you know, drinking water systems in these places uh, with the highest proportions of their populations uh, that were Black, right, tended to spend more time out of compliance with the law uh, for more violations and uh, for more contaminants. Uh, and on top of that, even when you know problems were identified in, in these communities uh, and, for, and, and when enforcement actions were actually taken, uh, the problem of maintaining water systems still uh, did not correct you know, these issues in, you know, in these communities, especially in black communities. Um, and one of the you know, last things was that you know, communities in which you know, water violations and race intersected uh, were found all over the country, right? It wasn't just a Flint issue or Chicago or New York or an Oakland issue, right? These issues were taking place, you know, all over the country, right? And in, uh, in all regions, right? That, that communities of color, in particular black communities, uh, were more likely to struggle from, uh, you know, from these violations of, of water systems. And, you know, I think while this isn't news, you know, or, or reality, uh, this isn't news to many of us who are living it, right? It, it's, it's important to have this data backing up uh, what black communities have been experiencing and saying for decades, which is, um, you know, our, our, our living conditions have, have, you know, placed us and segregated us in communities in which, you know, we are being, uh, our, our water rights are being violated. Uh, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stop right there and I'll look forward to answering, you know, your questions. And before I close, I'll say that, you know, water quality is just one aspect of issues, water issues that Black communities face. Uh, you know, we still have issues of uh, water being inexplicably high and unaffordable. Uh, we have these issues of uh, limited programs for assistance and water bills. Uh, we have issues just with access uh, to water broadly, and then you know this this very real struggle of uh, transparency and, and access to data from the water systems you know who are supplying you know water to to black communities. So uh, thank you.
Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Etienne Toussaint, who is an assistant professor of law at the UDC David A. Clark School of Law. He teaches contracts and co-directs the Community Development Law Clinic. Prior to joining the law faculty at UDC in 2017, Professor Toussaint served for two years as a visiting associate professor of clinical law and Friedman Fellow with the Small Business and Community Economic Development Clinic at the George Washington University Law School. At GW Law, he supervised the representation of entrepreneurs, small businesses, and nonprofit organizations in the Washington DC metropolitan area on a wide range of transactional legal matters, including entity formation, contract drafting, business counseling, and intellectual property and tax issues. Thank you. Um, first, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to join this esteemed panel and discuss the intersection of community development and black lives in the age of COVID-19, a time that's marked by social unrest, looming global economic crisis and political uncertainty. I'm honored to participate and contribute a few insights from my ongoing research on food insecurity, racial capitalism and their implications for environmental justice. Uh, I'm also honored to be joined on this panel by my colleague, Dr. Sabina O'Hara, who I've been working with as a co-author on forthcoming scholarship on these various issues. And we're happy to share that information with the ABA in the future uh, to disseminate to our audience. So before I begin, I'd like to share my screen. I have a few slides that I'll use as a backdrop for my talk. In, in my brief time, I'd like to share a few thoughts on health and um, on health and wellness in urban spaces using Washington DC as a case study uh, after highlighting some of the racial disparities in DC with regard to the impact of COVID-19. I will explain how the vulnerability of low income black and brown neighborhoods can in part be explained by the legacy of racial segregation and housing stemming from the practice of redlining. Um, however, as I'll, as I'll discuss, these challenges also stem from something much larger and more pernicious than residential segregation. Uh, shifting our focus beyond redlining, then I'll provide a brief overview of racial capitalism, which as a concept seeks to convey how racism is embedded in our economic system in ways that hinder resilience for black and brown communities, especially during times of crisis. And here I will focus specifically on the issue of food insecurity and end by noting some of the ways that black lives matter, both as a movement and as a broader historical idea converges with current food justice efforts. In 2019, over 17,000 people swarmed the streets of Washington, DC for the annual rock and roll marathon. And I imagine they did so for two reasons. First, Washington DC is a beautiful city to run with abundant green spaces from Rock Creek Park to the National Mall where cherry blossoms are within view to the National Arboretum. Uh, second, the benefits of running outdoors in green spaces are well known. Running has been shown to improve heart health, assist with weight loss and improve mood in fact, in a 2014 study in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, it, does, it found that even five to 10 minutes a day of low intensity running is enough to extend life by several years compared with not running at all. Further exercising in green spaces decreases noise and air pollution, improves immunity functioning by providing exposure to beneficial microbiota, 
and simply feels good, especially compared to the hustle and bustle of downtown. But running outdoors is not always safe for everyone and everywhere. It seems in America today, as conveyed by the killing of Ahmaud Arbery by white vigilantes for jogging while black in the wooded outdoors of Satila Shores, Georgia, and the harassment of Christian Cooper while bird watching, which became an endangerment when a white woman called the NYPD and pretended that he was threatening her life, that the health impacts of running or spending time outdoors are less a matter of how one runs and more a question of where or who. One of the impacts of historic racial segregation in housing in Washington, D.C. has been the segregation of green space with more green space and opportunities for outdoor exercise available in predominantly white neighborhoods. This singular point, the lack of access to green space, is perhaps one of the reasons why the residents who live in Ward 8, one of DC's predominantly black neighborhoods, experience an obesity rate of 45%, while the residents of Ward 3, a predominantly white neighborhood, only has an 8% obesity rate. As I will show soon, there are other reasons, but let's assume for now that Black folks simply don't like to exercise because they lack access to green space and consequently suffer the most from pre-health conditions, such as diabetes, that leave them vulnerable to COVID-19. What might we expect to see? The statistics would prove our instincts right. Most of the lives lost to COVID-19 in Washington, D.C. have been Black. Here they represent 81% of deaths in April 2020, yet Black residents only comprise 49% of the population in DC. And perhaps this is to be expected. According to the CDC, Black children are more than 20% likely than other children to get asthma. Black families are more than 40% more likely to have high blood pressure. Black women are three times as likely to have lupus than white women. People with sickle cell anemia are especially susceptible and vulnerable to respiratory viruses. To be sure, we're not talking about the prison population. If we were, the situation would only look worse. Not only is the prison population disproportionately Black, prisons routinely have unsanitary conditions and incarcerated people cannot practice social distancing. What I'm talking about is urban communities and DC is not an outlier. Across the nation from New York to Chicago to Detroit to Milwaukee, COVID-19 is similarly disproportionately devastating Black and Brown communities. Certainly, the underlying health disparities are significant. DC's Black residents are more likely to be affected by diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, asthma, lung disease, and heart disease. But why do these preconditions exist? Well, some studies suggest that the wealth gap is playing a role. Comparing the district's 32 highest income census tracts, which all make over 110,000 a year, with the 32 lowest income tracts, with annual incomes under 35,000, reveal striking disparities across behavior, health, and chronic conditions. Members of DC's poorest communities were twice as likely to be obese and report regularly receiving fewer than seven hours of sleep. They were also three times as likely not to exercise. Higher rates of obesity along with less sleep and exercise are well-documented effects of longer commute times, fewer walkable areas, crime, and stress associated with poverty. As shown on these maps, DC's Black residents are highly concentrated into DC's poorest neighborhoods. And these are the areas that experience persistent poor health, low educational attainment, and higher rates of incarceration. Other studies reveal that access to health and nutrient-rich food plays a second important role. The majority of DC's food deserts, also residents, uh, are in predominantly low-income and Black neighborhoods. The United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, defines food deserts as urban neighborhoods and rural towns without ready access to fresh, healthy, and affordable food. Of the eight census tracts in Washington, D.C. that qualifies food deserts, all are located east of the Anacostia River, which has long constituted a demarcation of D.C. neighborhoods along socioeconomic and racial lines. What does this mean in language that we can all understand? As recent as 2017, residents in Southeast D.C. marched in protest 
because there were only two Safeway supermarkets in Ward 7 and one giant supermarket in Ward 8 to serve more than 150,000 nearby residents. When we ask why some communities are so overwhelmed by health preconditions for COVID-19, the simple answer might just be that some households cannot access adequate food supplies that are healthy and nutrient rich. To understand why food deserts exist in 2020 though, we need to go beyond redlining back into a time to the foundations of modern capitalism. The issues that we are facing go much deeper than residential segregation of the Jim Crow era. Indeed, as I and my colleague, Dr. Sabina O'Hara argue in a forthcoming article, the legacy of racism embedded in American capitalism drives many of the problems that we see today. What is racial capitalism? Simply put, it is the process of deriving social and economic value from the racial identity of another person. As an analytical framework, it brings distinct forms of colonization organized around racial hierarchies together into a unified system of capital production focused on the dispossession and genocide of indigenous people, the enslavement of black and brown people, the importation of indentured immigrant laborers, and the dismantling of European ethnic diversity into a melting pot of white supremacist racial hierarchy. Racial capitalism suggests that the process of uneven and segregated community development is not due to competition in a fair marketplace, but instead is an intentional process of creating racial hierarchy to sustain a capitalist system organized around racialization. Today, neoliberalism as a political ideology only strengthens the impact of racial capitalism. It fosters, as scholar Corinne Blaylock contends, an economic marketplace reliant upon the creation of stable and well-protected property rights, the enforcement of private contracts, and the limitations of exercises of government power to enable an ideal of entrepreneurial liberty, not visions of a collective society. This sustains a, a market-centered idea of what it means to be an American citizen. Start your own business, save your money, fend for yourself. You are, as William Ernest Henley declared in the famous poem Invictus, the master of your fate and the captain of your soul. Accordingly, as we see today, essential workers are predominantly low income, working class, women, and people of color. Their sacrifices sustain the racial hierarchy, yet they are also invisible to us. These dynamics not only define the problem, they often shape our vision of solutions. We must compete and build our own answers as we chase the American dream. Although I don't have time to explain in more detail today, these ideals emerge in the most recent urban farming bill in DC, where the government has promised to lease land to residents based upon a competitive application process to enable ambitious entrepreneurs to help solve the food crisis on their own. Such efforts only shift responsibility to the individuals and away from a collective mobilization against a corporate food system. And where does the movement for Black lives fit into this equation? First, it urges us to revisit history. In the early 20th century, the district was home to a network of small grocery stores and informal cottage industry food carts called Hucksters that sold produce, fish, and meat door to door. Food choices offered by these local small businesses were tailored to the cultural and ethnic characteristics of DC's diverse, albeit segregated neighborhoods. The network of DC's small stores and food carts were supported by cooperatives that consolidated purchase, purchasing power and community capital, facilitating a degree of economic autonomy and collective upward mobility. These efforts emerged in resistance to racial oppression and segregation. Indeed, Black farmers, both in rural and urban spaces, have experienced a long history of state-sanctioned discrimination that robbed them of millions of acres of farmland and billions of dollars in lost wealth. A trend of out-migration by white citizens to the suburbs that began in the 1950s led most of the DGS stores being closed in the 70s and early 80s 
as supermarkets moved into affluent DC neighborhoods, offering an array of products that made it close to impossible for small stores to compete. The result was a rapid loss of purchasing power and jobs, followed by a steady divestment of food businesses, especially in the neighborhoods east of the Anacostia River. Yet the idea of cooperative economics, of shared profit and responsibility via localized economies persisted in various ways. The Free Breakfast Club for School Children program run by the Black Panther Party, which was founded by Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale helped to meet the needs of impoverished urban neighborhoods with under-resourced lunch programs. And today, we see the spirit of cooperative economics live on in urban farming initiatives driven by members of marginalized communities. For example, Soul Fire Farm in upstate New York offers a Black and Latinx farmers immersion to do just that. Since 2012, the program claims more than 350 graduates 83% of whom are farming or otherwise involved in the production of food following the program. Soulfire is part of the Freedom Food Alliance, a collective of farmers, political prisoners, and organizers who use food justice to address racism in the criminal justice system. Well, where do lawyers play a role in all of this? Lawyers play a critical role in realizing the vision of organizations like the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, which, which I would say is a part of the movement of Black lives in its ideology. The NBFJA is a coalition of Black-led organizations working toward the cultivation and advancement of Black leadership, building Black self-determination, Black institutions, building and organizing for food sovereignty, land, and justice. Lawyers can utilize legal tools such as the community land trust and the cooperative business entity structure to help empower local residents with ownership and leadership in food justice efforts. In so doing, they help to localize the future of food system reform and combat the forces of segregation not only residential segregation, but economic segregation that we see impacting communities today in the age of COVID-19. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to answer questions later in the question and answer period. Our next speaker is Dr. Sabina O'Hara. She is the Dean and Director of Land Grant Programs for the College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability and Environmental Services or Causes of the University of the District of Columbia. As Dean of Causes, she is responsible for academic research and community outreach programs in the tradition of land grant universities and is leading UDC's efforts to a, building a cutting edge model for urban agriculture that improves the quality of life and economic opportunity for urban populations. Dr. O'Hara is a respected author, researcher and higher education executive and is well known for her expertise in sustainable economic development, global education and executive leadership. She has experience in virtually every aspect of university administration including curriculum development, strategic planning, program accreditation, international partnerships, and research collaborations. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me um, on, this, on this panel. I am delighted to uh, follow my colleague, Etienne Troisson. Um, with some uh, perspective from an economist. So thank you for letting me uh, sneak into your, uh, your deliberations here. Um, and I too will share the screen to uh, show you some slides along with my remarks. So um, as you've already heard, uh, the District of Columbia is continues to be highly segregated. And I want to reflect a little bit on where we are with food access and outdoor space and where we're going. Uh, so where we are, let me provide a little bit of background from the perspective of 
an economist, um, this is what I would call the, the dominant view of the economy. It's all about the economy, isn't it? Um, and the economy somehow is a bubble in space. It has absolutely no context, even though we know that people are essential and that um, impacts from economic activity are serious, both in terms of their social and environmental impacts. But where are these contexts? Well, more recently, you might say over the last 30 years or so, um, we've adopted a little bit of a more enlightened view, which we could also call uh, the 3P model. And namely, it's about profits. The economy is still very dominant, but it's now also about society. We've recognized that the economy has a context and it's about the environment. And so the story goes, this profit, people and planet view holds that if we manage to somehow organize our fares in such a way that we stay within that sweet spot of this Venn diagram and, and organize our economic activities in a way that they recognize the need for, for social and environmental contexts to be sustained, then everything is gonna be just fine. Well, I have news for you. The real thing looks like this. The economy is a subset of society and culture, which in turn is a subset of the environment. Um, and so it would behoove us to focus more on the context itself rather than the economy and to ask the question, how does economic activity impact that social and environmental context which in, within which it invariably takes place? Well, I would submit to you that food brings context into focus. In fact, it forces us to deal with context. Namely, it connects us to nature as human beings like little else. Our bodies need to be fed and the food that feeds our bodies comes from nature. We would be hard pressed to imagine how to grow food without photosynthesis and even indoor growing would leave a much larger energy footprint than the use of nature. It connects us to each other and to our cultures. It impacts human health. It impacts the use of natural resources. And it connects also to many other sectors of the economy. So what does this context look like? And my colleague, Professor Toissant, has already described that context for you in Washington, DC, which is organized into eight wards administratively. 13% of DC households in the nation's capital are food insecure. And this means insecure on a quantity as well as a qualitative basis. Food insecurity implies that we don't simply have enough food. Um, and that's what 19% of households experience. They experience food hardship, which means not enough food consistently year round. But food insecurity also has a quality perspective namely food of insufficient quality to support an active and healthy life. And so 37% of DC households with children are unable to afford enough food and to meet the threshold of food security. This leads to enormously high food related illnesses, particularly diabetes, hypertension and obesity. And these pre-existing conditions then present an increased vulnerability to a shock event like COVID-19. Um, when it comes to the environmental context, so here's some other interesting data related to food, namely 11% of all US greenhouse gases are directly related to food transportation. 80 some percent of DC's fruits and vegetables stem from California, not exactly a small carbon footprint. 25% of CO2 emissions worldwide stem from food transportation and 70% of global fresh water is used for agriculture. Agriculture is highly centralized and we have seen the vulnerability of these long supply chains of a centralized food system in COVID-19. Now we also have a designation of essential workers and these essential workers are often uh, food workers, farm workers, 
who are seasonal and who are low paid. And by 2040, the whole, um, the whole challenge will have exacerbated because by then we will not have to feed 7.2 billion people, but 9 billion people. I'm just gonna briefly show some of the economic disparities that my colleague already mentioned, um, both in terms of income and unemployment. And this is what it then looks like in terms of food related illnesses. These are the eight wards of Washington DC. The yellow bars is obesity of the population over 18 and the red bars are diabetes rates. This is the highest income and most white ward in the district. And Ward 7 and 8 um, have the highest populations of uh, non-Hispanic Black populations. Um, and they also have the lowest household incomes and the highest unemployment rates. With uh, our experience of COVID-19, um, the problem has been exacerbated. What you see here is a food supply chain. And of course, the shortest supply chain is to go directly from your home garden to your plate. That gives you the most control over your food when you at least grow some of it and you know what goes into your body. This is the food chain that my colleague Etienne alluded to that was quite prevalent in the, between the 1920s and the 1960s in Washington DC when we had small food stores and hucksters who distributed food in neighborhoods across the district. And that food goes from small farms to transportation to a farmer's market or direct delivery to the households and to your plate. This is the food supermarket food chain that we're all accustomed to. It goes from the farm to a transportation system, to a distribution center, to the store, and then to your plate. And now we have added to that supply chain in the virtual economy, we have now added additional distribution and packaging centers where workers often sit elbow to elbow and to repack the food for further distribution. So there is nothing virtual about this new added virtual reality to our food supply chain. It is very material and very real in terms of its, its impact on workers. So where are we going? Well, at the University of the District of Columbia, we're the only exclusively urban land grant university in the nation. And so we felt we should really focus on urban food and make an upfront investment in urban food. And so we have been building urban farms and you see them. Uh, this up here is our main campus. It definitely is not located in uh, a food apartheid neighborhood. But the other farms are in those neighborhoods where there is very limited access to fresh food. And this is what they consist of. Each farm consists of four components. It's about producing food. It's about preparing the food, distributing it, and closing the loop with waste and water recovery. So each location, while it has these four components, it looks different based on its social context and its environmental context in these different neighborhoods. So sometimes we grow food in soil. Sometimes we grow in raised bed gardens because we have soil contamination issues. And sometimes we don't grow in soil at all. What you see here is an aquaponic system where fish are grown in these tanks. The fish and excrement is the fertilizer for the plants. The plants take up the nutrients and the water recirculates back into the fish tank. This is a method that uses only 10% of the water of conventional agriculture. So it definitely lowers also uh, the footprint on natural, natural resources. And then one of the most underutilized spaces in cities are roofs. And so we also grow food on roofs. The second component, food preparation, adds value through processing. This is where a lot of the cultural identities of food come in, but it also serves as a way of adding nutrition education, cooking classes, and education on food safety. Um, and I was um, all ears uh, in uh, Dr. Orr's presentation about water and water quality, because this becomes a really important issue also with food. Um, distribution happens in farmers markets, but also 
food trucks. And these are not food trucks that serve you a prepared lunch, but that bring food to neighborhoods. Um, also collaborations with niche markets, uh, what the USDA calls ethnic crops are crops that are not native to the Americas and DC has a very lively um, uh, community of immigrant populations. And so one of the missions of these food, hub, food uh, urban farms is to provide fresh food to communities that have different food cultures. And last but not least, a great deal of activity of composting to improve soil health, using food waste to generate energy, um, capturing rainwater for irrigation, and installing rain gardens and increasing permeable surfaces to mitigate both heat effects and flooding in a urban scape that is usually paved over where rainwater then shoots off the top of the roofs or the blacktops to, to create flooding. The university has made an upfront investment in these building these farms and they're in va various stages of completion. One is in Ward 7, our largest farm, about three acres. We have um, over 60 community garden beds there um, and demonstration sites, how to learn to grow some of your own food and how to take it to a commercially viable level. Um, in Ward 5, we have of an urban farm with both an aquaponic and a hydroponic system. And again, community gardens that are available to the neighborhood at no cost. Um, in Ward 8, we have a hydroponic and an aquaponic system. It supplies uh, some of the uh, senior citizens in the area. Um, and again, some community garden space in that location. And last but not least on our campus, our main campus in Ward 3, we have a demonstration of a 20,000 square foot food producing roof. Um, again, hydroponic and aquaponic systems, as well as a very flourishing farmer's market. So the real food system then needs to be decentralized. It needs to have much shorter supply chains, it needs to be collaborative because these farms can only be commercial, well, commercially viable if we get beyond what Etienne already described at this very privatized, very individualistic system in which private ownership becomes uh, sort of the, uh, the linchpin for, for uh, thriving enterprises. And we really need to recover a system of public space and public ownership and shared ownership um, to restore a food system that also restores other ecosystem services in the urban scape and that improves physical, mental, and spiritual health. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions during the question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, if you have any questions for our panelists, you can use the Q&A function that's listed on your screen. Our final speaker is Sajid Khan. He has worked as a deputy public defender in Santa Clara County in San Jose, California since 2008, representing clients and adult and juvenile misdemeanor and felony matters, and now handles homicides. He maintains a blog on social and criminal justice titled Closing Arguments at the sajidcon.tumblr.com and also co-hosts the Aider and a Better podcast with friend and public defender colleague Avi Singh. Hi, good, good morning everybody uh, from here in California and good afternoon to all of you uh, there uh, in, on the East Coast and in different parts of the country. Uh, thank you to our esteemed panelists for their um, eye-opening um, words and research and uh, information. I'm going to be speaking uh, about a slightly different uh, area of, of law, and it's not going to be um, based on any research. I'm not, a, I'm not an academic. I have been working as a public defender in the Bay Area for about a dozen years, uh, representing the ind indigent in our community, uh, meeting with them at our local uh, jail, uh, representing them in our courthouses. And so what I am going to be describing and discussing this morning or this afternoon for some of you um, are based on those experiences in, in San Jose, California at the jail and in our courthouse. I've been asked to speak about 
the impact, the generational impact of incarceration and racist policing on communities of color and specifically on the black community. And so I'm gonna to try to outline some of the things that I've noticed in my years as a public defender and how uh, our systems do impact black communities in our country and specifically here in the Bay Area. What immediately comes to mind for me is a courtroom experience that I had a few years ago when I was representing a young uh, Latino teenager who was uh, accused, uh, um, who was being prosecuted as an adult for a gang related murder for something that he uh, allegedly committed when he was just 16 years old. Um, while standing by his side in the Santa Clara County courtroom for his arraignment, I glanced at the jury box in, the, in this particular courtroom and I looked around at the, at the other uh, people that were uh, there for their arraignments, all adorned in county jail uniforms, all waiting to be heard by a judge. Um, I looked around and I noticed that everyone in the courtroom in that jury box was either a black or brown teenage or 20 something year old young man, all sitting in jail, all staring down the, battle, uh, the barrel of felony charges, all looking at potential prison sentences. And it was a startling image and a, a reflection of the reality of our uh, country and specifically our, the reality of how the machine of mass incarceration rocks and scars communities of color in our country. Um, I also now think of, as I'm reflecting on this topic, I reflect on the first entry points into our carceral system, and it's the contact with the juvenile justice system. I remember a time when I was a high school freshman, I was about to start playing uh, JV football, and I uh, went to my lo local Mervyn store, uh, which is an old department store, I don't even know if they still exist, and I stole a pair of Nike socks. Uh, quickly, uh, I was caught by the um, security guard at the department store, I was taken to an office, and then my mom was called, and my mom came and picked me up, and I was uh, taken home and disciplined at home, shamed by my mom and my dad, given some, um, some discipline there. But at no point were, was the police department called, at no point was a probation officer called, at no point was I taken to a police department or to a juvenile correctional facility or anything like that. During that time too, maybe when I was in seventh or eighth grade, uh, I would get into fights at school, uh, get into disciplinary problems at school, and at no point was there a police officer at my school who was taking me to juvenile hall. Uh, at no point did the administration call the police. Instead, I got sent to the principal's office and then I got sent home with uh, some sort of yellow or pink slip for my parents to dole out discipline to me. And at no point did I have any contact with the carceral juvenile justice system. On the other hand, I've represented young juvenile, young boys uh, in our, young boys and girls in our juvenile courts here in Santa Clara County. And I've learned and seen that young black and Latino boys don't get afforded that same graceful treatment, that same empathy, that same compassion, even for petty crimes or disciplinary issues at school. Oftentimes we see that children who are already suffering in their childhoods, suffering trauma in their childhoods, uh, poverty, broken homes, abuse, many of the manifestations of the policies and the systemic racism that has been outlined by our esteemed panelists earlier in this panel, uh, we will see these young black and brown boys and girls um, have that trauma manifest in behavioral issues, either in the community or at, at, at their schools. And this, these behaviors, whether they be fighting or uh, talking back or even violence, um, aren't the result of these young people being bad kids, but instead I have come to realize and know that these, this, these behaviors are oftentimes the manifestations of that trauma, of the layers of trauma that they're suffering. And oftentimes they're already at underserviced and more downtrodden schools that aren't sensitive to that trauma or aren't ready or equipped to respond as necessary and as needed to that trauma. So what happens? For these young and black and brown boys and girls, so often instead of getting uh, sent home to their parents like I was, uh, the police are called or already on site at schools resulting in, in contact with county probation departments, stays in juvenile hall, and ultimately a loss of innocence. These are the first transformative traumatic experiences for young people of color with the tentacles of mass incarceration. And these contacts often escalate into longer juvenile hall stints that scar our young people. The system rips them from their families, from their homes, disrupts their schooling, 
exposes them to other crime-involved youth, and then traumatizes them through the inhumane means of incarceration. I remember that same young man that I represented who was being accused as an adult, as a 16-year-old, who was in juvenile hall at the time. I remember visiting him at, at juvenile hall and seeing that he stayed in a room with a light that never turned off, a toilet just a few feet away from where he slept, and he ate poor ventilation and no windows. We wouldn't subject even um, our worst enemies to that type of uh, in, in, indignity, but here we were exposing this 16 year old young boy to that type of inhumane treatment. And we don't, we can't even uh, quantify the trauma that he endured as a result of that. And that is just one young man. And uh, when, uh, when we do incarcerate so many across our country in the same way or even worse. These young boys and girls after their stints on the inside in juvenile halls often leave worse off than they went in and, un and are unre unrealistically expected despite tra these traumatic experiences to somehow normally and naturally reintegrate into their homes, schools, and communi communities seamlessly. And oftentimes this cluster uh, of experiences results in exacerbated mental health and substance abuse issues, which sometimes manifest in further criminal behaviors and then all oftentimes just graduating them into adult courts and adult jails and prisons. So that's my, my brief experience um, in terms of the uh, school to prison pipeline and how we see these, these subtle small encounters that can be otherwise uh, treated in very different ways, um, often resulting in severe trauma that results in the growth of our mass incarceration system and then ultimately graduating these young boys and girls into our adult system. That's also coupled with how we police our communities. As, as um, uh, Professor Toussaint uh, talked about, we have, um, or he has alluded to with Ahmad Arbery uh, and the, the vigilantes that killed um, him on the streets, we still see to this day, as, as was exemplified by Rayshard Brooks and, and George Floyd, that police officers in our communities continue to reckless, recklessly and unreasonably kill black men uh, across this country every day. And that's not even to mention the daily inhumanity and terrorism that is brutally inflicted upon communities of color and particularly uh, young black men that goes unprosecuted by DA's offices and falls below uh, the headlines. When police officers unlawfully and unreasonably pull over, stop, tase, frisk, search, baton, handcuff, photograph, shoot, sick dogs upon our fellow human beings and specifically fellow be human beings of color. That type of terrorism is happening in our country every day and is terrorizing and, tra and traumatizing uh, young black men in, in our communities. We, we see the disproportionate police stops and searches of people of color for often, often ridiculous uh, pretextual reasons by police officers who aren't members of the community are antagonistic, aggressive, rude, and belittling. Uh, we've, I see people getting stopped for riding the wrong way on a bike. Uh, for not having a bike headlight, for riding without fare on a public transport, air fresheners hanging from their rear view, cracked windshields, not having current registration tags, often, often things that are functions of poverty, and I'd imagine uh, anecdotally are functions of the systemic racism and the redlining policies that are, we're discussing here today. So what we see is that these, these pretextual stops often result in the indignities and trauma and terrorism that is inflicted by police on communities of color, and in particular, uh, black men and black young men uh, in our country every day. And again, that trauma is uh, something that is hard to quantify, but I see it and know it um, in the people that I represent every day. We also see policing, racist policing in the name of gang laws and prosecutions that are only levied on communities of color and specifically were started uh, in response to uh, young black men who were accused of being uh, gang members in particular parts of our country like Los Angeles, New York, and in Washington, DC. Um, what happens is every uh, young man who, uh, well, they're with these policies, um, district attorneys are seeking to establish and accrue uh, investigation and information and evidence uh, that these young men of color are gang members, not for when they, not uh, ultimately to be used when they are adults and then ensnared in the criminal justice system, 
So there is a system of policing where police officers are dispatched to particular neighborhoods in our communities and are essentially, uh, are essentially um, asked to, to, I'm sorry, uh, they officers run through these neighborhoods and target uh, young men of color and essentially chase them, corral them, cuff them, question them, photograph them, uh, all for the purpose of gang, and I use the word gang with air quotes, gang intelligence collection, evidence that will later be used by DAs or district attorneys as part of gang enhancement prosecutions and in possession, in positions of heavy handed prison sentences if and when these boys end up, boys and teens end up committing crimes. These gang and these gang policing tactics and gang prosecutions, again, are only levied on communities of color and are specifically levied upon uh, black, black young men and Latino young men across our country in San Jose, primarily upon Latinos uh, of uh, Latino teenagers in our communities. And so there is this, uh, this set of gang um, policing and gang enhancements that further traumatizes um, young men of color in our country. So what we, but what we fail to recognize and what prosecutors fail to recognize is that these, even when we do have quote unquote gangs that are um, present in our communities that fit the statutory definitions of gang behavior and gang crimes, what we fail to recognize and what I've come to learn is that these gangs and their members are often merely manifestations of systemic failures in our communities of color, poverty, missing fathers, broken homes, and the trauma that I've described earlier. Gangs manifest in response to vacuums and voids in our community that are not being filled by community partners, by schools, by families, um, and by government agencies. All of that combines or is a, is, is a part of our system of mass incarceration. And so what happens as I've already outlined in the juvenile court system um, happens even more so in our adult system where there are, there are disruption of lives for petty, offense, petty offenses, interruption of work, housing, family relationships and finances. We also see the trauma of incarceration. Uh, we see the means and methods of the way we incarcerate in our jails and our prisons. Uh, where we, we know uh, that people that are come into our jails and our prisons are subject to inhumanity, indignity, and actual and an affirmative violence, both by correctional officers and by, um, by other inmates. We know that there is family separation that's been ha happening in our system of mass incarceration for decades and centuries in our country. And we know we see that in uh, the way that we incarcerate. We see that there are limited visits for people that are incarcerated with their families. We see the locations of prisons in our states. In California, prisons are in the most remote, uh, far away places, making it really difficult, almost impossible for family members to visit. Uh, there is uh, often no physical contact between uh, those that are incarcerated and their families. And then they're subject to expensive um, uh, phone calls that make it difficult for them, for family members to, to keep in touch. And then somehow when these people, uh, often black and brown, uh, leave these jails and prisons, we expect them to come back and be normal and integrate into our communities despite the trauma that they've endured, despite the interruptions of work, school, and family lives that they have suffered. We also see the tentacles of mass incarceration in the branding of people as felons, as offenders, as strikers, as convicts. Uh, with a societal apprehension and unwillingness to hire those with criminal history records. This becomes a state sanctioned stigma that normalizes the status of these people as second class citizens and de facto legitimizes their discrimination by employers, welfare officers, lenders, landlords, and neighbors, among others. This creates a further perpetual underbelly in these communities that spans generations. And then you also think of the disparities that we have in terms of Black people sitting in our prisons across the country for lengthy and life sentences, oftentimes for crimes that they committed as juveniles or as youth. We have these uh, men sitting in our prisons across the country, again, that is a manifestation or is a, a symptom or is a representation of the separation of families. We also see the loss of intellectual resource in certain communities where we have a void of these men who are sitting in our prisons as opposed to at home and in their communities. There is a void of insight, experience, leadership, and something as basic as supervision. And then finally, I wanted to note uh, another factor that I think is often overlooked 
and it's in jury trials and in jury selection. Um, because of the things that have been already outlined by my esteemed panelists in, in terms of the, um, the impact that redlining and other systemic racist uh, policies have had resulting in poverty within certain communities across our country, what we have oftentimes is black men being accused of crimes, being brought before courtrooms and judges and juries, and then uh, seeing a, a jury pool that is not a representation of the communities that they come from and a jury pool that does not look like or have the experiences that they have. And what happens is when we do surprisingly have black people that come into our jury pools, they are often excluded because of the experiences that they have suffered or endured. So they themselves having had police contacts or being, being in touch with the juvenile justice system or being, um, being impacted by gang policing, when they explain those reasons to judges and to prosecutors, they are often removed for the very reasons uh, that have traumatized them and leaving our jury pools less diverse and our uh, people uh, with uh, less likely to have a uh, jury pool of their peers. Or alternatively, oftentimes uh, people of color who do come into our jury pools, oftentimes black people, um, are uh, impacted by the systemic racism and the policies that we've outlined here today and may not have the job security, the child care, or other uh, factors that can allow them to serve on, on juries, especially for jury trials of a lengthy period of time. So what happens is this becomes a de facto uh, discrimination where black members of our community are unable uh, to serve because of sy systems in place that essentially make it impossible for them to serve because especially in jurisdictions where we don't pay jury members. So ultimately, these are just some of the things that I wanted to outline um, as it relates to my anecdotal experience uh, from my years as a public defender on the generational impact of our systems of mass incarceration and racist policing that has traumatized and um, affected uh, the, the black community and continues to affect the black community um, every day and until and unless uh, there is systemic uh, change and a complete overhaul of how we police um, our communities and also how we respond to the manifestations of trauma and the wide spectrum of human behavior in our country. Uh, thank you very much. At this point, we are going to um, go into a question from the Q&A, and this is an open question to anyone on the panel. Um, an, anonymous, an anonymous user asks, what zoning or land use or local policy changes should activists be working for on the local and state levels? So, so maybe I can I can uh, take a uh, crack at it here. Um, when it comes to the to the urban farms and uh, a more localized food system, one of the impediments is um, that most of the solutions that are currently out there still continue to be based on the notion of private property ownership and an individual entrepreneur. And there, is, there are some successful models out there that are more collaborative, like cooperative models or employee ownership models where ownership is shared. Um, but particularly in urban communities, the biggest impediment is the high value of land. Um, there are certainly some cities where land values have declined and where urban uh, agriculture comes to the rescue of plighted communities where land value is, is very, very low. But in, in most of our cities and certainly in Washington DC, land value continues to be very high. And so unless we have an alternative to that where land is publicly owned and then made available or is collaboratively owned and then make it available for, uh, for food production um, and uh, green infrastructure systems, uh, 
um, the high land value is is a huge impediment. Um, yeah, I can briefly follow. It's it's a great question. It's also a very complex question. Um, but I'll just offer a, a response in one way. I think what most people would say is that zoning reflects what one might expect from a history of um, racial redlining, which is to say historically black communities are zoned in one way and historically non-black communities are zoned in another. This you know, explains why you might find liquor stores, mm -hmm. you might find uh, certain kinds of industrial uh, sites located in poor black communities. It also explains why you might find wealthier white communities not zoned for um, multi-unit dwellings, not zoned for apartment buildings, but zoned instead for single family occupied units. And so to some extent, zoning has facilitated and extended the history of uh, segregation that was enacted through the practice of redlining. But to Sabina's point, there's also a sense in which the way we think about zoning sustains um, the ideal of the economy itself, which is to say, even in the practice of rezoning spaces for business or rezoning spaces for a diversity of um, kinds of residences, we also, I think, need to think about um, diversifying how we conceptualize the use of the space and the ownership of the space. Historically, we still think about ownership and use in individualistic and competitive modes. Um, and, and so to Sabina's point, in a, in a, in a city like Washington, DC or any other urban site, um, even if you rezoned a space for business, you still, uh, many communities and individuals still face the hurdle of competition of, of the barriers to entry because of the, the, the market structures that exist. And so rethinking ownership, rethinking collaborative ventures in the marketplace will also go a long way to rethinking how people operate in a rezone environment, in a, in a rezoned community. Um, this question was for Mr. Khan. Um, what can be done once someone is involved in the court system after the police have been involved and he or she is facing a judge? Are diversion programs at all helpful? Well, I, I, I think that there, we have to move away from the one size fits all uh, system that we often utilize in our courthouses and in our communities. Um, there has to be a recognition of the individual uh, needs and individual um, traumas that the, in, the person before the court has been uh, subject to or is in uh, need of intervention for. Um, as I've already, as I've discussed, um, one thing that's really critical is avoiding uh, the, the young person going into a carceral setting, going into the juvenile hall, even for one night uh, or going into jail for even one, uh, one day. Um, that type of trauma uh, cannot be um, minimized and cannot be overlooked. Um, and in fact, um, what, I, what I would suggest is that there has to be a more trauma sensitivity uh, in, our, in our criminal justice system, more empathy for what the, uh, who the accused is and what, they are, uh, what their behavior is a manifestation from. Uh, so if someone, as the question has outlined, is already um, been contacted by police and brought before a judge, I would hope that we reimagine our system and, and envision a system that is trauma sensitive that is uh, tailored uh, to, that can be tailored to the individual, unique individual before the court um, and does not exacerbate their trauma 
by caging them in juvenile hall or uh, the jails. And diversion programs are, um, I think, can be very powerful. But as I've often seen in our juvenile court system here in Santa Clara County, the people tasked with effectuating those diversion programs are probation officers who are police officers who are not trained social workers or therapists. Um, oftentimes they have massive caseloads or are not trained to really get to know the young person that they are tasked with serving. And so they do these um, kind of band-aid fixes uh, that are not fixes at all and oftentimes are a result in even more trauma. And so we have to reimagine the way we um, way these interventions occur and who is involved at those stages of inter intervention, utilizing uh, more social workers, therapists, people that are trained to be compassionate and empathetic, as opposed to those that are trained police officers who are uh, essentially trained to be um, unforgiving, unmerciful, and ultimately uh, resorting to carceral um, answers to uh, issues that that are that will ultimately become even more exacerbated through incarceration. Okay, another question was for Professor Toussaint, and it said, you mentioned a flaw in the current farm bill as it affects economic injustice in the area of food distribution and availability. Um, can you just explain that a little bit more? Sure, um, and, I, and I'll try to be brief because I think it's it's a much uh, it's a very big question that we're still entangling. But uh, so to give a little bit of history, in, in 1986, uh, the first bill was introduced by the former um, council chair in D.C., David A. Clark to launch a program for urban farming in the district. And even at that time in the 80s, the thought was uh, to develop something that could address the existence of food deserts, the lack of food access and um, food insecurity that overwhelmed the predominantly black and low income wards in the district. Um, you know, however, 30 years later, DC is still struggling with these issues. And so the amendments and efforts to roll out that initial program in the 80s is ongoing and, and more recent. Last year in 2019 was the most recent amendment. And, and, and the flaw that I point out and, I, and, and myself and Dr. O'Hara talk about in our work that, that we'll share, we will share once it is published um, soon, I think the key flaw that we see is a failure to disentangle some of the principles and ethics of capitalism that force us to view ourselves as individuals operating in silos, as opposed to citizens within a community that both can grow and profit together and be collectively accountable and responsible for the communities where we reside. What I mean by that is in 1986, when David A. Clark presented this bill in its language, he offered it simply as a program for community gardens, a program for um, buying clubs and, and farmers markets and ways in which the local community could access food. What we see in the most recent amendment is the formulation and institution of a land leasing uh, grant program in which residents of DC or businesses that are formed in DC uh, compete. They submit a application and it's a competitive bidding process. And the winner gains access to this parcel of land for you know, a five year period where they can grow produce, you know, create an urban farm. What we don't see in the legislation are a couple of things. We don't see language about where that food goes. Uh, and and as, as some who know about um, uh, urban, some of the things about urban farming that are unique is that there are techniques that allow you to create very, very high quality produce. So one might imagine a savvy entrepreneur could use an urban farming opportunity to sell produce to restaurants in downtown DC, for example, sort of bypassing the very issue of food access. Um, but also there are um, skills, resources, and 
um, and, 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 and sort of tools and strategies that one needs to have at their grasp to be able to take advantage of such an opportunity. Um, and so what we see then is a continuation of this idea that being a citizen in America, the land of opportunity means, you know, working hard and succeeding because this is a meritocracy and the, the winners will be the ones that, you know, work the hardest and win in this competitive game. And, and so I think that ethic we see as a flaw because it presents this approach and strategy as the natural choice when there are in fact other options. Not only are there examples in other parts of the United States, um, where governments are creating platforms for communities to work together collectively, for communities to own businesses and land together collectively. Um, and so therefore they can pool capital, they can pool resources, they can work with local universities, work with local organizations. Um, but also there are examples in other countries. In fact, there are examples in countries in Europe, in countries, uh, in other parts of the world where we can draw from. And so this idea that um, the economic marketplace, when the government, the, this idea that the government's role is to simply provide opportunities for people to compete is I think a very limited view of the government's role. And it's, but it's one that fits very well with the neoliberal model which is to say the government's role is to strengthen economic markets so that citizens can compete equally. And this notion that liberty means that the government limits its interference with that, um, with that competition, with that marketplace. And so that is some, one of the flaws we see. I think another flaw and others, I, I think especially um, Jeremy might uh, might uh, sort of share this view that there's, there's a sense in which um, the current farming bill in DC doesn't engage the sort of environmental justice implications of the risk of urban farming. In the bill, there is a waiver of environmental liability that might stem from contamination of neighboring communities from the usage of the land um, if they use site soil, if they use soil that's not native to the actual site. Uh, the reason for that is because historically, um, low income communities were contaminated. And so if you were to, you know, put a farm in a low income community that's predominantly black, there's a really high risk that there could be contamination of that soil that could damage the food. Um, something like a flood, and, and now you have contaminated water, you know, leaching into neighboring homes, and, and et cetera. Um, you know, the solution that DC implemented was simply to waive liability. If an entrepreneur is able to bring soil from the outside in, utilize high tech technologies such as hydroponic farming, but again, these techniques are very capital intensive. So, what does that mean? in an area in DC, for example, that might have contaminated soil, local residents are likely not going to take on that risk, but a, a, an entrepreneur who has the capital and resources may come in and utilize you know, their expertise to then enter that marketplace. So that in addition is a challenge. And I think a flaw in the sense that it doesn't empower the local community um, and it, it, it may, in fact, not address the issue of food access that David A. Clark was trying to address in the, um, the original 1986 bill. And if I may just add, you know, the, the uh, Adam Smith, who is uh, sort of pointed to as the father of market economics, as we understand it, um, his more, what he considered his more imp important work, the moral sentiments, uh, states, um, you know, in the historical perspective of the Calvinist that he was, um, that the market is, a, is an effective allocation mechanism when it operates within a, an ethical an ethical framework, an ethical boundary, which he considered to be compassion. Uh, 
But today, uh, the role of government is not to reinforce that ethical framework of compassion, but it is to protect the market. And those are two very different things. All right, we have another question from the Q&A section that um, I would like to direct to um, Mr. Orr. Um, what are your views on the most effective ways that other lawyers of other communities will be able to support the Black Lives Matter movement given the powerful um, fact basis set forth in the different discussions that the different panelists have had? Yeah, sure thing. That's a, I mean, that's a great question. And I, I, I know personally, I've been plugged into the National Lawyers Guild for years now, and that's where I spend, you know, much of my time. And for the last few months since the protests have been going on, you know, here in Detroit as well, I've been out there regularly with, with protesters, protecting them, you know, showing up, uh, you know, for them in, in many ways, getting them out of jail, work with a team of attorneys. I think it's, it's about like finding a way to show up in ways that the movement needs you, right? There's a role for everybody in the movement and it may look different, uh, but I think allyship is so important, right? In, in the midst of all that's going on. So I think it's rather it's, you know, showing up in your own capacity, right? Rather it's showing up, you know, as a, as a volunteer attorney with an organization like ACLU or, or NLG or, or, or any other type of effort. Uh, but I think it, it's, it's, um, it's kind of like, like John Lewis would say, right? Find a way to get in the way, right? And I think that's where attorneys really need to step up in this moment. I know I've been seeing it, you know, here in my own activities, but kind of all over the country. Uh, and there's no shortage of opportunities to do so either. Okay, so this question was um, for um, Mr. Khan. So do you think restorative justice practices would help divert these young men and women from prison? And has this been something that's been explored in the Bay Area? Yes, definitely. It's um, well, yes to the first question. Uh, it's something that uh, needs to be um, implemented more broadly, um, restorative justice practices where there is um, an attempt to um, understand the, um, for on both sides, there is an attempt for empathy to be cultivated on both sides, the, by the, for the victim and for the uh, accused, uh, where the accused is understood as to what was going on in their uh, respective life um, that manifested in this particular behavior, and for um, the uh, victim to be able to express themselves as to uh, the impact that this behavior had on them. Um, and through that effort, there can act be actual uh, healing, there can be understanding, and then there can be um, uh, solutions that can be identified to hold the um, offender, for lack of a better term, accountable, and also to ensure uh, restoration and healing for uh, the victim. And ultimately, um, the hope will be that this type of behavior doesn't uh, repeat. What we have now in our system is essentially uh, a system that deprives both uh, victims and offenders of their uh, humanity, and then often um, does not result in a solution to what occurred, but instead just a punishment uh, to what occurred. And uh, restorative justice practices uh, allow for answers and solutions to um, misbehaviors in our community as opposed to just punishing, um, punishing them, locking people up, and then um, resulting in that type of behavior not being thoroughly addressed and potentially happening again, again, because of um, uh, the trauma of incarceration, oftentimes exacerbating the issues that resulted in that behavior in the first place. In terms of the Bay Area, uh, yes, we see uh, restorative justice practices on a lower level, generally uh, with misdemeanor crimes, but where we need to see it uh, more so is on uh, more uh, serious crimes, felony level crimes, and even crimes that are uh, often labeled as, as violent, um, because oftentimes those crimes are the ones that are excluded from restorative justice practices and are the ones that we as a community silo into our prisons and our jails um, and are not appropriately remedied and, and the offenders nor the victims are appropriately healed um, to create uh, more public safety and sustainable outcomes. Thank you. As a final question, um, 
the, in the Q&A, we had the question, can any of the panelists speak to how local boards of education can support the Black Lives Matter movement? I wanted to echo what I discussed earlier in terms of boards of education. I mean, one of the things that we're seeing here in the Bay Area are, are moves to take police out of schools. Um, I, I discussed it a little bit um, in my comments about um, the responses to disciplinary issues in our schools uh, should not be to call the police, to have people taken to juvenile halls, to have young people uh, be booked and be incarcerated, being seen by judges. Instead, we, I think there needs to be a dramatic shift in the resources allocated to our schools so they can become trauma sensitive and so that they can um, address the um, underlying causes of misbehaviors in our school settings as opposed to just funneling um, troubled, quote unquote troubled, our problem children to police and into our juvenile halls and then ultimately into our jail and prison systems. Um, so there has to be a reframing of how we uh, as a community respond to um, quote unquote misbehavior or what I uh, deem to be manifestations of trauma within our school settings, especially at a young age. Okay, so with that, um, thank you for joining us for this free webinar. We'd also like to express our gratitude to this esteemed group of panelists. You are all doing. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> you are all doing such critical work, and we thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to share your knowledge, research, and experiences. The section of civil rights and social justice provides free webinars and resources for legal professionals and advocates nationwide. We hope this helps you in your work. And again, if you can, please consider joining and becoming active in the ABA. You may do so at ambar.org forward slash CRSJ. You can find information on other free programs on the CRSJ webpage. Best of luck in your work and stay safe, everybody. Thank you.